Good evening. Tonight we are talking about my money rules and I have 10 of them and I'm going to share them with you and then I'm going to go into detail on them. Now, first off, let me show you what these money rules are. And remember, these are my money rules, not yours. I already know what's going to happen. I start talking about how I do this and that and then the first thing people say, must be nice. Oh, Ramid. Oh, yeah. stop it. Just stop. These are my money rules. I'm showing you them because I want to show you what I developed for myself and then I want to hear what your money rules are for yourself. Okay, so here they are. I'm going to hold them up to the screen and I'll screenshot them. I'll link them or I don't know. Just screenshot. Yeah. All right. So that's so that's it. That's the end of this video. Have a nice night. <laughs> no, let's talk about them. So I'm going to read them off first and then I'm going to go into detail as to why I came up with Rule number one, always have one year of emergency fund cash. Rule number two, save 10% and invest 20% of gross income minimum. Rule number three, pay cash for large expenses like an engagement ring, wedding, dream honeymoon, 20% down minimum on a house. Rule number four, never question spending on books, appetizers, health, or donating to a friend's charity fundraiser. Rule number five, business class on flights over four hours. Rule number six, no limit for spending on health like a personal trainer or education like courses, events, etc. Rule number seven, buy the best and keep it for as long as possible. Rule number eight, earn enough to work only with people I respect and like. Rule number nine, marry the right person. And rule number 10, prioritize time outside the spreadsheet. Okay, just from listening to these rules, one through 10, what do you notice? What do you notice? Some of the things that I would notice if I were sitting in your chair might be, first of all, who the hell has money rules? The fact that there are rules in and of themselves is interesting. And I wonder how, how did this person come up with these rules? So we're going to talk about that. I noticed that um, things like uh, business class on flights over four hours, that would have been inconceivable to me several years ago. So these rules change over time. Okay. And I also noticed that some of these are a bit confusing. Like why, why does this guy keep on mentioning appetizers? Well, what's up with that? And marry the right person. What does that have to do with money? So these are some of the things that I might notice, but my question to you is what do you notice before we start working down the list? Cass, are there any comments on what people notice? No, there are no comments. All right. Not wait, yet. Then, we got to give him some. Then some I get time. to do the favorite, my favorite thing, which is I'll just talk. <laughs> That's what I was put on this planet for. All right. So I want to talk to you about um, how did I come up with them and then we'll work down our way down the list. So I think that in life, for the important things, everybody should develop a point of view. And I believe that a point of view is one of the rarest things on the planet. And those important things in life might be money, might be relationships, it might be health, uh, it might be parenting. There's a few things, probably fewer than 10, that are really important enough that you develop your own philosophy. And every time I meet someone who has a philosophy on one part of their life, I just love it. I've met parents and they parent in a style that's a bit surprising to me, but I love hearing the way they think about it because they have thought about it and they have written down or encapsulated their beliefs into a few bullet points. So with money, which is part of my business at I Will Teach You Be Rich, I have developed my own philosophies about spending and saving. And so what this allows me to do by narrowing it down Every day we wake up, there's a million decisions we can make. Should I eat out? Should I buy this new iron? Uh, we're going to grocery shop. Should I go to this store or that store, etc. And by coming up with a few key beliefs, suddenly I eliminate 99.9% .9 of decision making and I can go back to the important things in life. Just to give you an example, with uh, number two, save 10% and invest 20% of gross income. The way that that flows into my life is if I am doing that, then I don't really have to worry about spending at a general level. 
Why? Because I'm following my rule and these rules, if followed correctly, lead me to the right place for me. So that means suddenly if I'm wondering, should I buy this extra large salad or whatever? I should never be asking that question. Instead, that's a $3 question. I should be asking this 30,000 or 300,000 or even more question, am I correctly saving 10% and investing 20%? That is a big question. Going for an extra large drink is a $3 question. Okay, so that is why I came up with this and that is why I would challenge you to come up with your philosophy or your own money rules. We got some responses. Okay, what do they say? Okay, um, first one, they're personally tailored to your values and you. They're not cookie cutter. Correct. Uh, your rules are more about people than just money. What's money for? At a certain point, you've covered the basics. You've got to use it for the things you love. Great mm -hmm. observation. Your rules reflect your values and personal experiences. Yes, and you can see that with, for example, books. I love books. I wrote books. I love them, so I'm gonna prioritize those more. Pretty much very few people will have books or appetizers in theirs. Just doesn't make sense, but those are part of my heritage. So of course they're important to me. Um, notice, Cass, that I don't have anything about cars on here. Mm, yeah, you don't, don't care. I don't really care about cars. Mm -hmm. And I don't have something like, um, buy the newest computer every year. In fact, quite the opposite. Buy or the headphones. Best. Or headphones. <laughs> buy the best and keep it. For a long time. I believe that. I live that. So great observations. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you say we work down this list and talk about why? All right. So rule number one, always have one year of emergency fund in cash. So I I'm more conservative in many ways when it comes to finances. I want to make sure that I set myself up so that if something catastrophic happens, I don't have to worry about my finances. And we are seeing that happening right now. Now, I typically don't, I didn't recommend a one-year emergency fund for most people. Uh, typically, it was three to six months. I have recently recommended that everybody have a one-year emergency fund. You have to understand why I recommend that, and you also have to understand the trade-offs. So, I chose a one-year emergency fund because I've built up enough income and net worth that I, uh, yes, I might be sacrificing a little bit of returns, but I'm doing fine in terms of investing. I want to protect my downside, okay? Downside protection. For most people, if they think about a one-year emergency fund, it's overwhelming. It's a lot of money. And also there's a trade-off where they're just keeping money in cash and not investing it. So that's a trade-off you'll need to consider, although my recommendation is now for everybody to have a one-year emergency fund liquid. I keep it in a high-yield savings account and you can do the same thing with yours. The key principle here is to always plan for the best and the worst. Now, if something bad happens like a global pandemic, if you are laid off, you have to remember you're not the only one who's going to be looking for a job. So is everybody else. And so with a one-year emergency fund that's liquid and available, you know that at least you're going to buy yourself some time. You can cut your expenses, you can get creative with your earnings, and you will buy yourself some breathing room. So that is the reason and that is first because we always want to make sure we have a roof over our heads and enough to eat. Number two is growth. It shifts very quickly into growth. Save 10% and invest 20% of gross income minimum. Okay, what am I doing here? So I want to save 10% because I can use that savings as I cover in my book for things like my emergency fund. I can also use it for things like uh, vacation, things, a down payment on a house, things that I know will be coming up in the future. Invest 20%. I'm investing more because especially if you're younger, every dollar you put into investments is going to be worth many, many, many times more. So a lot of people who are new to money, they save a lot and they feel really good, but they're actually just treading water because the real money is generated from investments. That is why I prioritize investments higher than savings in terms of percentages. Now, why did I say gross income? Some people do uh, percentages based on gross. Some do it on net. Net is what you have after taxes. That's really up to you. I like to live life 
in some ways on hard mode. Like I said, I want to be conservative. So it's like people who run with a weight vest. You know, you've seen some people, they run with a weight vest or they train at elevation. Why? Because when they go back down to normal life without a weight vest or back in normal elevation, it's a lot easier. So if I'm choosing gross, that means I have to save and invest more money. Now you don't have to do that. I just choose to do that because it forces me to get aggressive. I also want to point out that if you run a business, this number could be very different for you. Now, this is a little bit more of an advanced concept. Most people who have a nine to five job, they, let's just say that for easy math, they make $1,000 a month. So they could take 10%, put in savings, 20%, put in investments. But a business owner might uh, pay themselves a salary, but once every year, once every couple of years, they take a huge distribution. So that distribution could actually pay for one, two, three, four years of your contributions. So again, that's a little bit more of an advanced concept, but business owners who are slightly more sophisticated will know what I'm talking about. So what I'm saying is that my income could be lumpy. That's okay, I can figure it out on the back end. All right, uh, oh, final thing, why? Why am I talking about this? If I save 10% and I invest 20% or more, I know that I'm doing great on the income and growth side. That is awesome. And that means if it comes to sitting out at a restaurant and ordering a cheesecake or an apple pie, I'll just get both. It doesn't matter because I know that the big question, the $30,000 or the $300,000 question is already being automatically handled. And this is one of the most important rules here. Pick a rule where if you just follow this, you are doing the right thing financially. This is the crux of the rules. It's really important. Okay, that's rule number two. Rule number three, pay cash for large expenses like a wedding, honeymoon, etc., and 20% down minimum on a house. I probably shouldn't have used the word cash because people think that I'm literally handing over, you know, like $10,000 in cash. No, what I mean by cash is that I'm not going into debt. Right? I'm still gonna pay with a credit card because I wanna accrue rewards and consumer protection, but it means that I have the cash available to be able to go and, uh, for example, buy a ring or pay for a wedding or a honeymoon. Okay, And with a house, again, very conservative, 20% down minimum, if not more. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why would you pay that much down? You know, Interest rates are low, all that stuff, fine. You can choose maybe to put 5% down, but have the remainder in cash, but that's a very, very advanced concept. Most people, frankly, choose to put 5% down because they don't have the cash. You do not want to do that. If you go to buy a house and you can't put 20% down, you're not ready to buy a house. Okay, and I talk about this extensively in chapter nine of my book. You will discover lots of phantom costs you never expected. Oh, your roof, oh, the backyard landscaping, on and on and on. And if you've just been planning that your mortgage is it, you made a big mistake. So again, play conservative. Be able to pay for the big things in cash. That's my rule. And therefore, I'm already thinking 10 years ahead. What are the expenses that we are likely to have in 10 years? Cass, what do you think we might incur big expenses in 10 years? Oh, definitely a car. Okay, good one. So we should probably think mm -hmm. about ballpark what kind of car would we like to get when do you think we might get it in fact let's just do it right now let's say we're going to buy a car i'm just going to make the math easy let's say that it's going to be um sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars okay i've never bought a car that expensive but let's just pretend when do you think we're going to get a car is it going to be next year no no let's say five years from now mm -hmm. that's 60 months away uh, i can put one thousand dollars a month into a sub savings account and at the end of five years, we are ready to pay for it in cash. Mm -hmm. so that's the way we would do it. Mm -hmm. What might be some other big expenses? Mm, maybe a house. House. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about a 10-year wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. We're going to do a big bash. Big one. Mm -hmm. And we got really inspired. And we were like, let's, let's really bring our whole family. And let's like make it big. So we start putting some money aside for that every single month. And the longer the time horizon, the less you have to save in order to hit that goal. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a more advanced way of thinking in the future, and that's where you can put some money towards as well in terms of savings. Oh, and some really nice sweaters too. That is a gift. <laughs> I'm not waiting 10 years for that. I'm talking about 10 days. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Number four, never question spending on books, appetizers, health, or donating to a friend's charity fundraiser. So I created this rule for myself because uh, when I went to college, I paid for Stanford undergrad and grad school with scholarships. And one scholarship that I got was incredibly generous and they effectively said, all of your books are completely covered. They even set me up with an account at the Stanford bookstore and I would get any book I wanted. I didn't even go to the normal register. I went to some other desk and they had my account on file and it was free. So I had free books for five years. That's like, it's like Willy Wonka. Mm -hmm. You know that kid who has like the fat cheeks and he walks in and he's like, Bleh. that was me in a bookstore for five years. So any book I saw, it felt like the most freedom I had ever had to be able to walk into what is my paradise and see a book on cults or see a book on personality psychology and say, I'm going to get that. Boom. Take it up. Read it. It's mine. And when I left college, I wanted to continue that. And I wanted to continue that freedom because it felt so good. And I realized that in the grand scheme of life, unlimited books is not that expensive. It's really not. And so I just made the policy for myself. And now whenever I see a book, I follow what I've invented called Ramit's book buying rule. If I ever see a book that's interesting, I click buy. Never hesitate, never equivocate. Similarly, um, appetizers. When I was a kid, we didn't, we hardly ever ate out. And we certainly did not get appetizers or desserts. We got maybe two pizzas for our entire family, two Cokes to share, and coupons. We always used them. Now it feels extremely freeing to be able to go and say, yeah, I'm gonna get that appetizer. Or, um, which appetizer looks better, this one or that one? Let's get them both. And so, uh, Cass, do you know my policy when I take my coworkers out to eat? Have I ever told you what it is? Mm -hmm. w what is it? Yeah, you, they can order anything on the menu. Yeah, the rule, I tell them, mm -hmm. I tell my coworkers, when we get a chance to meet in person, I say, I only have one rule, which is, whenever we eat out, if there's anything that even remotely looks good, you have to order it. And for me, the amount that I spend is small, but the joy in, Personally, being able to do that and to be able to do that for my coworkers is incredible. So the part of creating your own money rules is making them meaningful for you. Nobody else probably has this story, so this doesn't make any sense for you. But for me, I am smiling ear to ear when I see one of my coworkers, I don't know, should I order this steak? It's a little, I've never had it. Get it, please. Well, also that's interesting how uh, like, when I grew up and even, you know, recently when I would hear the word rules, yeah. I would think, oh, it's something bad, something restrictive, all that stuff. But like the one you just shared with your coworkers about they could order whatever they want is actually amazing and it's fun, it's interactive. So I think reframing the word rules great, too. Great insight. Yes. Rule. These are my own rules. So of course I want them to feel good and be empowering and give me freedom. I think it's a great observation. Um, donating to a friend's charity fundraiser. One thing that I have learned is that, have you guys ever done a fundraiser, a charity fundraiser? Most people have not, but maybe at one point or another in your life you will. Maybe you'll do a 5K, maybe you'll do a run for breast cancer, whatever the case may be. And I remember, I've gotten these emails from my friends, you know, when I was in my early 20s. And you know, uh, once in a while I would donate, but most of the time I wouldn't. And then I started doing fundraisers, <laughs> right? And Cass, we did one together. Uh -huh. We did a, a, a charity fundraiser to raise money for uh, children being separated from their parents at the border. Uh -huh. And we sent an email out to our friends. And I have to say that nobody really likes asking for money. Right. I mean, and no one really likes to donate. <laughs> and no one really likes to donate. Now, well, I was going to get to that. Babe. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the punchline. So I have to say that because I sell premium products and I have over 40,000 customers, I have no problem selling. And when I am doing it for a cause that I believe in, this money was not going to me or to us. It was going directly to people who needed it. I'm shameless. I told people, look, this is important. I need you to donate. 
And I watched what happened, right? I'm well versed in conversion and all these things. And it is amazing to see when you are on that side of the table, when you're asking for someone to donate money to something that is meaningful, that you feel vulnerable and you wish people would just donate fast and donate early and donate more than you asked. That's what I wish. And I was really humbled and surprised. Some people came in big. I'll never forget it. Some people didn't respond to the email or the multiple emails. And I'll never forget that as well. So my pledge from a few years ago was if someone is asking me for a charity fundraiser and they're a friend of mine or certainly a family member, it's a guarantee. I will always donate. That is a rule because the money is not going to change my life. But just to, when you're on that side of the table and you're raising money, it means everything that someone donates fast, they donate the full amount, or they donate more. Simple. All right. Number five, business class on flights over four hours. This is simple. It's something that I wanted. And when I first started off in my early 20s, I scoffed at everyone who's business class. Oh, so stupid. Why are they wasting money? And then I realized, oh, business class, pretty nice. And so because I could afford it and because comfort was important to me, I just made a rule. Now, the rule here uh, eases my decision making because I used to sit there and if it was a one hour flight or a three hour flight, a six hour flight, too many decisions. So here's the blanket rule. Four hours or more. My assistant knows my rule and she will, she knows the exact seat and seat number that I want to fly in and she'll just book it. No questions asked. So that is a policy I've now put into place. It's an awesome policy, but it, notice that it's also not first class or business class everywhere because I also don't mind sitting on any old seat if I have to, if it's a short flight, right? I'm healthy. I can do it. So part of these rules is not always going zero to 60, but finding when it's important to you. All right, that's that. Number six, no limit on spending for health, like a personal trainer or education, courses, events, etc. Just like I see a book, if I see a course or an event that looks good, I'm in. Price is irrelevant. I remember when I went to the Disney Institute course. I've been eyeing it for years. I finally was ready. I picked a date. I sent it to my assistant and I said, could you please book this for me, Orlando? I don't even know what that cost. I think it was three to $5,000, but it was important. And there are some things in life I just don't look at the price for. By the way, you have that too. Everybody has it. If you're a parent, whatever diaper brand you like, you could find a diaper brand for half the price, but you still spend on the one you do. If you uh, like a certain type of organic food, you could find something for half the price, but you don't. So all of us have something that is valuable and meaningful to us. For me, it just happens to be education and also health. So when, you know, I wanted to get a personal trainer and I don't want to look on YouTube and I don't want to do it myself. I want a trainer because I want better results. I want faster results. And I also want to go in and not have to think about it. So that's important to me. So I use my money to help me live a richer life. All right. Number seven, buy the best and keep it for as long as possible. So I grew up in a family where, you know, we saved, a, we had to save a lot of money. We were a frugality based company because there were six of us and my dad was the one going to work and my mom was home with us. But I did get glimmers of buying the best and keeping it. My uncle had, he was a photographer and he had a Leica and Leica is some of the best cameras in the world. And, um, the lenses are just beautiful. They're, they're functional pieces of art. They're just amazing. And he had given that camera to my dad, I think in the seventies and that camera still works. In fact, that's the camera that I learned to take photos on and develop in the dark room. So I started to get a taste for what it's like to have the best, but also to keep it forever. That camera has been in our family for generations and it will continue to be. And so I started realizing there are some things in life that I really care about. I guess when I started off, I couldn't really afford the biggest, best car, nor did I really care. I bought a Honda Accord. That's a good car. That thing will last forever too. It's been uh, still there. It's 20 years. The thing runs like brand new. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an example. In that case, I did not buy the quote best 
like most luxurious, or I didn't ball out on my car, but I certainly did buy the most reliable one, right? Great, Honda Accord. Uh, I apply this to my life with, um, when I bought my computer, in fact, Cass, this is something that I shared with you. When you were thinking about what phone to buy, I was like, mm-hmm. just get the one with the most storage space. Yeah. Remember, and it's, it's like 300 bucks more, but you will keep it for years. And what was your reaction at that time? I was like, what? Uh, no, I'm going to get, <laughs> I'll get the newest model, but the lowest storage space. And, but then I was always frustrated because I never had enough room. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So for the things that you use day to day, especially the things that are important, your phone, get the best, but then keep it. One thing I find is that people who buy the best often are just flipping it all the time. Mm. Now, if you can afford to do that, okay, fine. But a lot of times they'll say, oh, I'm going to buy these really nice pants or really nice this. And they wear it for one season and it's over. Mm -hmm. And they get the new phone or they get in the new house or car. That's a quick way to really spend too much money. Mm -hmm. When you buy the best, if you amortize it out over three years, five years, seven years, sometimes 15 years, the cost is quite affordable. However, the problem is you have to do the second part, which is to hold it for a long time. Also with a... Because I see this with clients and their clothing and wardrobe. So when you buy the best two, you also have peace of mind Mm. that it's not going to give out in one wash or two washes. Like, you know that you're going to have it forever and it's reliable too. I totally agree. And uh, I I can speak to that with my own clothing. So having bought really nice um, sweaters and pants... And then also, I don't need everything to be perfectly nice. I bought some things that are more budget. But when you really put them through wear and tear, you can see the difference. But I think peace of mind goes even beyond that. Mm-hmm. I had a, I've referred before to my cashmere sweatpants that are probably my favorite piece that I own. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, they're totally over the top. They feel amazing. I've worn them for what? It's been like three years. I've mm-hmm. worn them thousands of times. Yeah. The drawstring frayed and I took it back to the store and I asked them can you guys give me another drawstring it's a very particular type of drawstring it's visually it has an appeal to it and they said okay it's going to take us a few months to get it from Italy and I was like can you guys do something else and they had a tailor there he goes hold on a second he comes back upstairs he pulled a shoelace out of one of the shoes he goes let me try this I go what he goes just give me five minutes He put it in as a drawstring. He's like, I will style it so it looks exactly the same. And he, they messengered it back to me Mm. like three days later. Mm -hmm. I was like, and they, it looks really good too. It looks amazing. So again, why am I obsessed and why am I smiling so much over these sweatpants? It sounds ridiculous, but to me, I love them. I know that these things make me happy when I put them on. I've worn them for years. I bought the best. And I also have peace of mind that if something goes wrong. I'll be taken care of. Yeah. And they fixed it so quickly too. They're not doing that at Uniqlo. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, Number eight, earn enough to work only with people I respect and like. (sighs) Notice that this really only tangentially touches on money, but it's about the fact that I want to wake up in the morning and be happy with my coworkers. I don't want to have to work with Someone where when I look at my meeting invite on the calendar, the first thing I do is, oh, and I think some of us have had people like that in our life where they're just a downer or they're actually abusive at work. I will not stand for it. I have fired senior people at my company when I found out that they were being um, not nice to their other coworkers. And so I won't stand for it. And in my life, I want to earn enough to know that I can always work with people that I love or people that I respect, love, and or trust. And so that feels amazing to know that money gives me the ability to, ch- to use my values and work with people who I enjoy working with. So that's that. Number nine, marry the right person. Cass, you got any comments about this? Yes. Oh, let's, let's switch seats here. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is the no- number one most confusing one to people. They frequently say, all those make sense, it sounds awesome. However, Mary, what, what does that have to do with money? And I think that question is crazy because in my opinion, the decision on who you marry, if you choose to get married, 
is one of the most important financial decisions you ever make. Is your partner aligned? Do they think about spending and saving in generally the same way? Have you saved up 30% of your income and they have $75,000 in credit card debt? If so, you have a huge problem. Um, do they get nervous or scared? Are they abundant or scarcity minded? Like this is, you're gonna be thinking about this every single day for the rest of your life. And I remind you of somebody who Instagram DM'd me and said, uh, my husband spends way too much on iced tea. He spends $5 a day. And I'm like, wow, five, that's a lot of money. By the way, what's your household income? And then she said, $600,000. So just think about that. They argue about money every day because they see it totally differently. So when I say marry the right person, it means that money, like it or not, is an integral part of your relationship. It's everything from what kind of bread do you buy? Do you care about spending extra on the organic one with the nuts? It is where are we gonna send our kids to school, public or private? Are we gonna spend on a tutor? What hotel are we gonna stay in? How often are we going on vacation? And are we bringing our family? These are big questions that will haunt you if you don't think about them, or they can provide you joy if you do. That's number nine, marry the right person. And finally, number 10, prioritize time outside the spreadsheet. At a certain point, you've done the I will teach you to be rich system. At a certain point, you have your money automatically being saved. You have your conscious spending plan. You're investing. Everything's good. You won the game. Now it's time to turn the page and live life outside the spreadsheet. That means family. It means loved ones. It could mean being single, enjoying dating. It might mean health. It's not sitting and looking at Excel every day and saying, oh, this is so cool, uh, cell D32, uh, I, love the, I love the ratios. No, you won, move on. A rich life is lived outside the spreadsheet. And that is why that is my rule number 10. But what about the ROI? ROI, what's the ROI? Oh, what, what's my ratio? Ah. Get a life. There's so much more interesting things after you get the 85% solution implemented. You get your target date fund or your index funds. Tweaking around is not gonna change anything in a big way. What's really gonna change is you picking up a hobby. Uh, it's you calling up your old buddy from college. It's doing things outside of the spreadsheet. That's where a true rich life is lived. Cass, do we have any Questions yeah. that we should address? Yeah, we have a few. Okay. okay, on to questions. If you have questions, type it in the question box on the lower portion of the screen. Do not type it in the comment box. I'm not reading those. Wow. Thank you. Okay, question. Number nine, marry the right person who <laughs> reprimands your reader base. Love it. Oh, man, where'd it go? Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking. Let's see. Okay. I hope that in this silence, as you find this question, one thing I would ask people is really think about what your rules are. Mm -hmm. And it should actually be confusing to other people the more you dial in on what is special. Like that's why when people say appetizers, what's that about? It makes me smile because that's how I know my rules are mine. They are individually built like a beautiful suit, custom made. They're made for me. That is what a, a truly cohesive set of money rules will feel like and sound like to you. For me, I loved your book. Any plans on another one soon? I recommend it to all my clients. Ooh, I'll tell you what, I appreciate that. Thank you very much and thanks for spreading the word. If you have ideas about what you would like to see, please send me a note. You can email me, you can DM me, but if you have ideas of what you'd like to see next, I would love to hear them. So send me your ideas and uh, I'll be listening. Do you have any couple money rules? We do actually. I uh, have a few. Okay, so I remember, Cass, let's see if we can go back and forth because um, I didn't prepare these, but I do remember one of our rules is, I'm gonna talk about the wedding ones. Mm -hmm. When we go to a wedding, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. are the first people out on the dance floor. Yeah. And we never want to be the couple 
where people have to worry about where they see us. Yes. Now, these two rules came from our own wedding planning where, of course, we want people out on the dance floor and we noticed the people who were just out there just like having a great time. And then, you know, there's people who are like really hesitant. We noticed that. We also noticed um, when you're doing seating planning, you have people who you can put anywhere. You rank every single person. You have, yeah, you have to. <laughs> and you know, like these people can just mix it up with anybody. You can put them next to an uh, old auntie and they'll have a great conversation. Or you can put them with a young group and they'll be fine. There's others where you have to put them with people they know because they'll be uncomfortable. And we resolve we never want to be that. So mm -hmm. we want to be the couple where they can put us anywhere and we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good. Um, one that we, I think we discussed, I don't know if we landed on it, was uh, taken from your role about the business class. Was it four or five hours? What are we talking about? Uh, when we fly over four hours, oh, then we go, class? yeah, uh, I think you wanted to institute that for us, but I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I think we need to have further discussion. on this. So, but also uh, I want people to know that it's like an ongoing discussion though. It's not like we got married and then, okay, we have 10 rules right. because we both come from different money backgrounds and all that stuff. I'm actually glad you brought that up because that rule is interesting. So I said, I want to do that for us. Yeah. And you said, no. Why'd you say that? Um, just because I, I've never done that. Yeah. And so I was like, it, it was just outside of my realm. Yeah. And I automatically went to cost. Right. Whereas you were like, no, it's comfort. Like we'll be rested, all that sort of stuff. Totally. So, so. this is, yeah, this is, and we should pick this discussion up later, but this mm -hmm. is a great one where, like, you know, I'm used to flying above four hours because I've been doing it while I was single for years. But I also know that we have to discuss it because I can't just keep doing what I've been doing because now it's us as a mm -hmm. unit. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. How about travel? We made a rule for ourselves, which is a really big rule. Oh, yeah. The travel at the end of oh, the yeah. year. So, so it's we want to take a big trip every year. Mm -hmm. And that big trip is usually... Well, we've done it twice. It's been six weeks each time. Very, like, we go to crazy places. We go high, low. And we eat in people's houses and cook with aunties. But we also stay at these amazing hotels. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of that was we also prioritized our family. So we said we want yeah. to bring our family as parts of it, which we've done both times. Mm -hmm. um, that was good. Yeah. And someone asked in the questions if I have money rules. So I'm currently working on mine Good. and taking inspiration from Ramit. All right, next question. Let's see. Uh, okay. I'm still looking, uh, looking, Don't looking. Worry, time. I know there's not supposed to be silence. So. I will talk about um, money rules in a couple. The suggestion I have for you to make is to make money rules is to first start with something that is really, really fun. Your first money rule should not be restrictive. Your first money rule should be um, every year we are going to take one day and go eat at some crazy restaurant or we're going to try one type of food that we have never tried on this specific date. Something that gets you both kind of excited. That's when you can start to shift money rules from the uh, predominantly negative, restrictive view to something positive. Now, I will say that, Cass, when we started talking about our day-to-day -day spending plan, you remember that I said, look, my big thing is I want us to be saving X percent. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, the rest of the spending is relatively like whatever. Mm -hmm. But if we do that, we start there, we're good. Mm -hmm. And that was a way to really reduce the world down. Mm -hmm. So those are two things to think about with a couple. Start from a place of fun and also next, when you get to your spending, pick a savings and investing goal. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, what if your partner does not conform to 50% of your money rules? How do you compromise? We still, oh, we should do that, an episode on love and money. Okay, let's do that another time. Yeah, um, this is a good question. There's gonna be a lot of tears on that. <laughs> so... Um, First of all, they don't have to conform to 50%. And you're probably never gonna agree on all your rules. 
That's fine. Cass, do you even agree with all of my rules? No. No. Like, so, do you spend unlimited on appetizers or books? No. Yeah, so, um, you have to understand that your partner has a different worldview. That's okay. Your partner, depending on, you know, how you combine your money, might also just have a different amount of money or different ways that they like to spend it. And this is so common. I hear people saying that their partner spends way too much on video games and uh, another one will spend too much on hair and nails or clothes. And those are just the most common examples, but there are, of course, many others. Um, eating out, drinks, etc. What matters is that overall, as a couple, you've decided on a few key rules. We want to save this percent. We want to invest that percent. We want to make sure that after we hit our major goals, we each have some money that we can do whatever we want with no questions asked. But the fact of the matter is if you actually looked at how they're spending that money, you're probably going to be horrified. That's okay. Um, what I do think is important is that you get aligned on the big ones. Things like, are we having kids? What, what kind of lifestyle do we want for our kids? Uh, are we going to buy a house? What type of house? How much do we want to spend? If you can't agree on some basics, like we should be saving money, then you have larger problems, and I would definitely recommend a therapist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you invest differently for different goals, like a house or car vacation using a conservative asset allocation? Um, good question. Actually, very sophisticated question. So in general, if I am going to need the money in less than five years, I don't invest it. I just keep it in savings. Why? Because what am I gonna make an extra few percentage points but open myself up to massive downside risk? No thanks, I already won the game, no need to keep playing. Uh, I will tell you that I once recorded a video, I had saved up enough for a down payment on a house. And Cass, you and I talked and we decided we're not going to buy a house in the next 10 years mm -hmm. when we decided this. So I put the money in the market. I said, look, over 10 years, the money is likely to more than double. And that allows us to either get a nicer house or put more down than 20%. Um, so that was like a very, very long-term goal that I had already saved up for. In general, that's fairly unusual. Uh, but to answer your specific question, no, I want to keep things simple in my financial life. I got enough complexity. So either it's staying in cash or it's getting invested in my usual asset allocation. I'm not creating a separate asset allocation for different time horizons. I could, but why bother? Just keep it simple. That's not the 85% solution. So savings or invested, that's it. Okay. I noticed a lot of people are asking about, um, like how much to save for emergency funds, 401ks, where can they find that information? I will teach you to be rich, thank you. I have the exact percentages in the book. So you can find out exactly what percentage, you can even find out what percentage I recommend for like eating out and discretionary fun stuff, saving, investing, basic necessities like your rent, all of that is in there with clear benchmarks as well as the best accounts to use, even the phone numbers, even the words to read off to get your fees negotiated. Just get the book. Also, you've posted a lot of really awesome videos on YouTube, right? Yes, youtube.com slash Ramit Sethi. I go into more detail with some of these videos and of course they can join my newsletter at iwt.com. Okay, last question. How often do you reevaluate your money rules? I would say um, once every couple of years. Uh, I, I spent a while coming up with these, right? And a lot of it was just bubbling up and I would, you know, for example, I just felt so good when I would be able to order an appetizer. And I didn't sit there the first time I ordered an appetizer, this is gonna be one of my money rules. I didn't even know what my money rules were. But when I sat down to think of them, that was a months long process where I would think about what makes me happy, what makes me feel secure, uh, what gets me excited. And then I thought, is, does money play a role in that or not? And also, what do I just not care about? You know, there are things people expect me to care about. Like, um, Ramit, why haven't you bought real estate in New York? 
there, well, I have other things I care about more. So um, once I set those though, they fit pretty well. They fit like a really nice glove. So every couple years I'll relook at them and think about them. But I, I assume when my lifestyle changes and when our lifestyle changes, we'll probably reevaluate them. But for mm -hmm. now they fit great. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So thank you for watching. That was a little background on my 10 money rules. Again, those are my rules, not yours. I would love for you to leave a comment and tell me what are one to three of your money rules and then tag a friend to ask them what their money rules are. Let's get this started. So in the comments, tell me what are one to three of your money rules. Doesn't matter how crazy it seems, how outlandish, how weird. You love Dungeons and Dragons, be my guest. But tag a friend, let's go from there. Thank you very much.